All right, I'm back. We're chapter two recitation. This is our first in the series. I've drawn this model of an economy. It's the circular flow diagram we've talked about in lecture. Let's see if we can answer some questions about the circular flow. It says, refer to figure 2-1, obviously. Which arrow represents the flow of goods and services? So which arrow represents the flow of goods and services? Okay, so here's the market for goods and services. Here's the market for factors of production. Here are the households. Here are the firms. Okay, so firms make things. Households buy things. All right, so the flow of goods and services goes from firms to households. So the arrow B represents that particular flow, okay? So the answer is B, which is B. And which arrow represents the flow of land, labor, and capital, all right? So markets for the, fa ma markets for the factor of production are land, labor, and capital. And what it's saying here is essentially that there are households which sell their factor of production. I sell my labor. I sell my capital in the sense that I put savings in the bank. I may even sell my land or something to rent my land. But that goes in so firms can use these materials to produce things. So the factors of production go in. All right, so the answer is going to be C. C represents the flow um, of land, labor, and capital to the, basically into this market and up to firms. Firms hire these workers, borrow this capital, use this land. Okay? Which hour represents the flow of income payments? So income payments are what? Well, the firms has to buy these factors of production. How do they do it? They pay wages. They pay interest or interest on, on money they borrow. Or they pay rent on land that they rent. So firms make payments to the factors of production. So D represents that flow because it goes into the households. Okay. Ali buys a new pair of shoes at a store. Which of the arrows does this transaction represent? So, you're a household. You're going to go to the market of goods and services and you're going to buy shoes. What happens? Well, you give them money, they give you shoes. So, firms produce shoes, they go to the market, you get to wear them because you've earned money from the firm to then go into the market, buy the shoes. So, the answer to this one's going to be A and B, all right? This flow is from you to the firm in this market, retail store. The store delivers the shoes to you. That flow, uh, arrows A and B capture that particular flow. Sonia completes her first week of employment working as a hairdresser in a salon. On Friday of that week, she receives her first paycheck. To which of the arrows does this transaction contribute? All right. In other words, she has offered her services as a hairdresser. To a hairdressing firm. The hairdressing firm then gives her a paycheck. All right? This is flow C and D. She offers her services. She gets a paycheck. All right? The services go to the firm. The firm then produces hairdressing services. They then pay her. Okay? So that's represented by C and D, and the answer to that one is D. So this diagram, and I often students think it's kind of stupid, uh, kind of silly way to represent an economy. But think about it, it's about the flow of money, which is actually quite important. And I can give you a simple example. During the Great, Great Depression, we we're in the Great Recession, but the Great Depression, for example, households had lost faith in banks. So what did they do with their money? They put it under their mattress, okay? So they would earn money, go to the household, and save it here. They wouldn't put it into a bank who would lend it. They wouldn't spend it in a store. They'd put it here. Actually, there was, in a modern economy, the Japanese have one of the highest saving rates in the world, up to 10 to 15% of their income that they save. And there was a fear when their banks were in trouble that many Japanese households were not putting their money back into banks. They're actually holding on to the cash. And that takes money out of this flow. And money out of the flow means there's less money spent in this market here, which means there's less money going to firms, which means firms have less demand for factors of production, employment, etc. So this simple diagram can be expanded pretty easily to capture a lot more kind of uh, complications. Take, take the government. Take taxes, for example. 
You make money, it goes to the government. I could call this a tax, right? Goes to the government. Now, if the government doesn't spend the money, the money just sits with the government. But the government then goes and buys goods and services, all right? And that helps the flow continue. So one of the things about recessions right now is that American people are saving more than they were in the past. Saving rate was up to about 5 to 6% in the U.S. last year. That means that there's 5 or 6% less spending in the economy. That has fallen out. So we need government to kind of then pick up that extra spending and go into the goods and service markets and buy things to replace the savings by households. The savings by households is a good thing. People should be saving to get their portfolios back in balance. But it does take money out of the economy. And in the U.S. right now, about 71% of gross national product is accounted for by household spending, consumer spending, right? If that falls by 5% because they're saving, the government has to step in, run a deficit in the short term, buy the goods and services that are needed, build roads, build more schools, etc., buy these goods right here, and get money back into the flow. So even a simple diagram like this can be used to help give a rationale for why in a recession when households don't spend as much, government should step in and spend more. All right, I will stop there. Um, I wanted you to get the basic concept of the production possibility frontier and the circular flow diagram as a model of the economy.